Good morning or good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Goldberg for CED Green Tech. Um, and thank you very much for joining us today for this uh, EV charging webinar. Before we start, the Q&A will be uh, at the end of, of the webinar. And if you look at your, uh, at your portal, the Q&A section, if you ask the questions there and you, you, you pose them, then we can, we can answer them. We will answer all the questions. If we don't get through certain questions, we will ask, we will respond to you via email after the after the webinar. There's a recording of the webinar that we send out to all registrants. So everyone who registers and attend will get a recording of the webinar afterwards. Uh, contact your local CD Green Tech rep with any questions. You can you can contact us and we can get you in touch with the right person, or you can go to CD Green Tech dot com slash contact and we will um, put you in touch with the uh, the proper represent representative also the last thing is that this is a NAPSEP CE credits come uh, from attending this and so if you email us at hello at cdgreentech.com we'll announce that again at the end at the conclusion we'll be able to get you your um, your certification Once again, my name is Michael Goldberg. I'm the director of marketing here at CED Green Tech. Uh, I don't know if you know CED Green Tech. Some of you, some of you do not know. We are a solar uh, and electrical and renewable energy distributor. We're the largest distributor in North America. Uh, we have 60 plus locations nationally all over the entire country. Each location has an area of about 200 miles that it services. We have our, we have the largest inventory uh, in, in the country uh, of all kinds of products. And we have a fleet of our own trucks with our own delivery folks that roll daily to deliver products on time and correctly across the country. I'm so excited to have uh, NLX here today. Um, I'm gonna pass the, uh, the microphone to Elise Benoit. She's the VP of Marketing at NLX. Parenthetically, Elise and I worked together um, at a past company um, many moons ago. And so it's great to work with you again, Elise. Yeah, thanks, Michael. This is very exciting. Yes, I uh, before I was uh, working with EV charging and uh, EVs, I uh, worked in solar. And I had the pleasure to work uh, with Michael and other members of the CD Green Tech. So this is very exciting. Um, very happy to be talking to um, solar installers today. And um, I will also, um, my I have a co-presenter, Christine uh, Kuzak, who's uh, the head of customer support at uh, NLX. And then uh, we're going to be, let me just um, let you know what topics we're going to be discussing today. Uh, first, I'll be talking about uh, EV adoption and smart EV charging. And then we'll talk a little bit about the synergy that exists uh, between um, solar and EV charging and EVs in general. Um, and Chris will be um, talking more specifically about our smart charging um, station and then um, all the different um, software platforms that come with them. Um, and then Chris and I will also briefly um, describe some of the, the type of customers and um, uh, type of installations. Uh, that we see uh, happening in the marketplace right now. Um, and then um, Chris will close the presentation uh, with a little bit more uh, description and detail about um, EV charging installation. Uh, and she uh, is herself an electrician, uh, so she is uh, a really good source of uh, information. Uh, so please do not hesitate um, to ask a question, and I'm sure she'll have a lot of interesting answers for you at the end of the presentation. And uh, we, great. So first, uh, a very brief overview of uh, NLX uh, and what we do as a company. Uh, so first, we are a subsidiary of a large electric utility called NL, the NL Group. Um, it's a utility that's headquarters in Europe, but we have presence uh, in Asia, South America, uh, Europe, and North America. <clears throat> we are a pretty big uh, manufacturer of EV charging stations. Globally, we have over 130,000 charging plugs uh, deployed uh, in all the areas where we're present. 
So um, we are here and we have staying power, so there's no risk of um, dealing with any kind of stranded assets uh, with NLX. Um, and then LLX is a company also um, has uh, activities around um, renewable energy procurement and uh, demand response. <clears throat> Next. So um, let's start talking about <clears throat> EV adoption and EV charging. Uh, you can see on this slide, it's uh, showing you how fast uh, EVs are getting adopted. So essentially those two curves um, just show the same um, speed of adoption, uh, but a little bit differently. Uh, the slide on the right, um, if you look at the yellow line that just um, dips down uh, really, really quickly between uh, now and 2040, so over the next 10, uh, 15 years, uh, you can see that uh, people are going to be buying a lot less uh, internal combustion engine gas cars and a lot more EVs. <clears throat> and then uh, we see that these predictions are actually coming true. Uh, very often we see them actually, we see actual sales of EVs increasing faster than predictions. Um, and then um, you can see just like any new um, technology adoption, uh, there's going to be a hockey stick, just like um, if you compare EVs and uh, smart EV charging um, to smartphones, for example, you know that once people start adopting these new technologies, um, it just snowballs. So that's what we're seeing right now. And we think it's going to be uh, accelerating even faster. There are a few reasons for that. Um, one of the main reasons is obviously consumer demand. Um, people like driving EVs. Um, they drive better. They're cheaper to fuel. They're cheaper to maintain. Uh, they have more torque. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement uh, from people. And then what we see also at NLX is uh, once people buy one EV, they tend to buy another one. So uh, I've been with NLX for two or three years now. And um, over this two or three year uh, time span, uh, the percentage of our customers that own two EVs, uh, I think went from about 10, 12% to over 20%. So we can see that EV adoption is moving really, really fast, which obviously means people are going to need to charge the EVs, which you know means they're going to need um, charging stations. And um, another reason uh, why we see EV adoption and the need for EV charging stations going up really fast is on top of consumer demand, um, there is a, a big legislation and regulatory push, both at the state and uh, local level. Uh, for example, there are a lot of cities that are adopting new building construction codes uh, that require to have any new building be EV ready, meaning they need to have EV charging stations installed uh, on the premises. Uh, we see that in a lot of states um, and a lot of cities because they uh, are trying to, they're adopting sustainability goals and they're including uh, EV and EV charging in these goals. We also see um, that trend at the state level there are over 12 states now that have what we call ZEV regulation, which means zero emission vehicle regulations. Uh, California started that trend. A lot of the states are adopting the same regulations. And uh, there is a requirement, a requirement, it depends on the state, between like 7 to 10% of new vehicles uh, must be uh, electric by 2025. Uh, another trend in regulation that we see is um, we see more um, states and even countries adopting uh, bans of um, gas cars. Uh, this year, California announced a ban uh, starting in 2035. New Jersey is considering a ban in 2035. And globally, uh, the UK just announced uh, such a ban, I think, for 2030. Um, there are other types of legislation on top of um, you know, building codes and um, bans of ICE cars. Um, there are some regulations that are being put in place, for example, CalGreen, uh, that mandates a certain amount of um, parking spots in public parking spaces or uh, in new constructions. Um, and they require that these spots be EV capable. Again, it means um, that they need to have EV charging stations. Next. Um, and then another important point, specifically when um, you come, I, I come from the solar industry, where sometimes, um, you know, utilities were not always super excited about solar at some point. Um, for EVs, it's the opposite. They're really, really supporting EV adoption. 
Um, there's a very big and important reason for that. Um, as utilities are trying to decarbonize the grid, um, EVs are really offering what we call a virtuous cycle, meaning the more EVs are on the road, um, the more we have essentially mobile storage to um, store and use renewable energy that sometimes may be intermittent, like solar or wind. Um, so the more EVs are there, the more um, local distribution network can become greener and have uh, somebody or user that can actually absorb solar and wind when it's on the grid. And then vice versa, the more um, solar, or wind, or any kind of renewable energy that is absorbed by, EV char by EVs, the greener these cars are. Um, so because of you know, consumer demand and regulation, there is really a need for decarbonization of both the transportation system and the grid. And then um, that interaction between EVs and solar um, is something that is benefiting a lot of people. So there is a lot of uh, support for EV adoption. And um, what that means, it translates in a lot of um, incentives being available for uh, the installation and purchase of EV charging stations. For example, this is, um, you can see on this map, the little yellow dots are um, the utilities with uh, that have qualified or pre-qualified our smart EV charging stations for rebates uh, or incentives for both commercial and residential customers. And then the other colors is just um, local state incentives that are available to both commercial and residential and uh, residential customers. Uh, so that's an important thing for solar installers to know because there are lots and lots of incentives um, that are available that you can take advantage of in your uh, in your area. And um, next, we can see what kinds of incentives these are on the next slide. So um, as I was saying, this is an example of uh, commercial and uh, multifamily for uh, incentive for apartment complex. Um, there are a variety of incentives depending on where you're located. Some incentives are um, covering a certain percentage of installation costs. Um, some are covering both installation and hardware costs. Uh, some are providing uh, per unit incentives. Uh, some are looking at the overall cost of a project and uh, offering either, you know, up to 100% of the cost of a project. Um, so um, if you're a little bit confused or you don't know about these EV incentives, we have on our website um, a, um, a database of incentives. Uh, it is uh, show, There's a link on this slide, but we will also share that link later. Uh, you can just go on the website, enter your zip code and see what uh, residential and commercial incentives are available in your area. Um, now let's just spend a little bit more time about uh, the synergy between solar and EV charging. And there are a few of them. So first, uh, on the residential side, what we see, uh, and we see that you know every day, uh, I'm the head of marketing, so I can see uh, that synergy happening uh, in our customer um, data, in our customer base. First, uh, we can see that EV drivers, uh, when they, once they buy a, an EV, they first of all, they need a charger. And then after that, they start thinking, well, maybe they need to uh, install solar. Uh, so that's important for solar installers because that means in your area, you might have a lot of new residential um, customers that might be interested in uh, installing solar. Uh, but the way to get your foot in the door is to maybe install charging first and then um, talk about EV charging and installing EV charging and then uh, expand the conversation to installing solar because you know you have a very receptive audience. And then on the other side, um, there's also a synergy for existing solar owners. We know, like it says about 66, there are 66% more likely to purchase an EV. So it's, a, it's another reason, EV charging is another reason for solar installers to go back to the existing solar owners and then to ask them if they're interested in um, adding uh, solar uh, EV charging to their uh, homes. Uh, so it's, you know, that overlap also exists on the commercial side and we can go to the next slide to show that. Um, so again, there is an overlap between uh, the companies that already have renewable energy or are thinking about installing a uh, solar system uh, and or renewable energy system or purchasing renewable energy and then uh, electrification of fleets. 
Um, so a lot of companies are electrifying their fleets or they're providing EV charging as an amenity for um, their employees. Again, you know, it's a good reason, um, EV charging is a good reason to either contact new businesses or go back to existing businesses and do additional uh, business with them. Next. Um, yeah, one more thing that um, we want to talk about, um, if you read the news, there's a lot of news about uh, public charging infrastructure and the need for public charging infrastructure to support EV adoption. Uh, but in reality, most of charging happens either at home or at work. So about 80% of charging for EV drivers actually happens in people's houses because they come home and then they charge overnight. Uh, and then, or it happens at work, they drive to work and they charge at work if there is available, if there are available EV charging stations. Uh, again, it's a big opportunity for solar installers who are already uh, working either with residential customers or commercial customers, um, because you know that there's a big need uh, for EV charging, both uh, in the residential side and um, the commercial side. Another thing that um, I want to point out is a lot of people are worried about how long it takes to charge an EV, but on average, um, <clears throat> depending on people's commute, that you know that they might need more than an hour or two. But on average, it takes about an hour to two hours for the average EV driver um, to charge their cars, uh, either at home or at work. So it's a fairly low lift. <clears throat> And um, the other advantage of most of the charging happening at home or at work for solar installers, it means that you can uh, essentially install level, level two charging stations, which are faster and easier to install. And then Chris will be talking about the different kind of uh, charging station and what level two means uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, this is uh, something interesting. So um, when we work with CED Green Tech and uh, with uh, solar installers, we provide um, NLX uh, marketing collateral um, that explains the benefits of our products. But here is just a quick overview of um, the reasons why um, specifically commercial customers are interested in uh, installing EV charging stations. And um, these are some reasons that you can use when you talk to businesses in your area. One is uh, there's the possibility to generate additional revenue with uh, EV charging for businesses because they can charge for charging. Um, another one is, as I mentioned before, there are um, regulations that are local or state regulations that they have uh, to comply with. So sometimes they have no choice. Uh, a third one, and we mentioned that before, is they just want to retain or attract uh, employees or new customers or new tenants. For example, um, as EV adoption increases, people are going to be looking for apartment buildings uh, that provide EV charging rather than uh, go and rent places where they have no access to charging or customers uh, in uh, retail spaces will pick certain restaurants or certain stores uh, because there is an EV charging station available. So that's an important, uh, an important reason why commercial um, customers are installing EV charging. And then the last one is, uh, and we've mentioned that before, is a lot of businesses, businesses, small or large businesses have um, sustainability strategy and uh, EV charging is like sort of an easier, fairly quick way to uh, attain that, um, to, to fulfill these, uh, pl the sustainability plan that they have in place. Next. Um, on the other side, I want to make sure we spend a little bit of time talking about, um, you know, why solar installers uh, should be looking at EV charging and what's in it for them. Um, so if you're installing solar system for uh, commercial customers, uh, EV charging is a way to differentiate yourself uh, in your marketplace. Uh, a lot of companies are interested in not having 25 different um, installers or uh, partners with whom they work. So the ability to offer both uh, solar installation and maintenance and EV charging installation and maintenance um, is, is one way to uh, stand out. Um, the other reason is, as I mentioned before, a lot of incentives are available. So it, you know, it's free money that uh, your customers can take advantage of. And that's a really good reason to look at EV charging right now, um, because some of these incentives may not be available later when, um, when more and more people are uh, buying EVs. They may not need 
they may not be a need for uh, utilities or uh, municipalities or states to provide incentives. So now is the right time to do it. Um, and then obviously, as I mentioned before, it's just a way to either uh, reconnect with existing customers and generate additional revenue with these customers or get your foot in the door with uh, new customers who maybe were not thinking about uh, solar before, but now that they're electrifying their fleets might be really looking at on-site uh, solar on top of EV charging. And on the residential side, it's pretty much the same reason. Uh, you can provide additional services uh, to your uh, local residential customers uh, and then give them another reason to install a solar panel if they haven't not yet installed solar on their roofs. Um, one thing that I want to leave you with before Chris spends time talking about our uh, charging stations, um, there are two kinds of charging stations. One are called like quote unquote dumb charging stations and um, the other kind of smart charging stations. So NLX only sells smart charging stations. Uh, what a smart charger is, is essentially a charging station that is connected to the internet. Uh, and that's important because uh, it allows uh, the station uh, to uh, provide information about uh, charging patterns to collect data and also to respond to uh, remote signals, whether they are uh, signals that um, a commercial customer or residential customer sends to the charging station to stop charging when there's um, a lot of dirty electricity on the grid or to start charging uh, when the electricity that they're using is the cheapest. Uh, so it allows um, customers to track their consumption, to reduce cost, uh, to shift the when they're charging, uh, to make sure they're taking advantage of the cleanest and cheapest electricity on the grid. And then even more importantly, um, most of the incentives that I have been talking about, both uh, state, local utility incentives, are only uh, given to smart chargers. Uh, so if you're looking at uh, a variety of uh, charging stations, please make sure that um, you recommend uh, to your customers to install smart charging stations. It's really worth it, both in the short term and the long term. Next, and I think Chris is going to be talking about our smart charging stations right now. Yep, yep. Thanks, Elise. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Kluzek, as mentioned, and um, a little bit of background just quickly I, yes i'm i was an electrician here in san diego uh, i grew up in the trades with my dad being an electrician so um it made sense for me to follow and he was very happy that i did but um i also decided that i liked working with people a little bit more than um seeing the same people on the construction sites all the time so i ended up working for home depot in there as a their um, contact for contractors in their in the store and so I have an electrical background for the construction, I have a retail background, and I drive an EV. So I fit sort of the unicorn status that was sort of needed when this industry was first getting going, and um, it's been pretty pretty helpful for that. So um, I wanted to start though here with um, continuing with what Elise was talking about, you know, um, for the charging stations that we have, um, we do have only smart charging stations, and um, for very good reason, uh, when you have a dumb station, you don't really get the data that you want or need to know how your car is doing, how much energy you might be using. And I found that when I went from a dumb station to a smart station, it was like I had all of this information that I really found helpful. I knew how many kilowatt hours I was getting because that wasn't on my car when it finished a charge. It didn't tell me. So we have what we would refer to the infrastructure or the hardware. And then for that hardware, we have the software that you can makes it smart, and then we have the services to go along with it. So in the in, in the infrastructure, we have everything from your B to C or your regular commercial residential um, person who buys one station to put at their home or um, small business, and then it moves up from there to your uh, B to B or your business customers, your commercial customers, um, and then we have the software. So drivers, businesses, utilities, fleets. Um, owners of the stations can control how they're used, who can use them, how much they can use them, if they wanna charge them. Um, so we, we cover all of that with our software. And again, it's accessible through an app or a dashboard online. And obviously the owner of the station has more control if they're, they're controlling a fleet or commercial um, location. 
and then our services with energy services, installation services. We work closely with installers, um, particularly solar installers. We have a lot of contractors and installers we work with already, um, so quite familiar. And I can speak as a solar owner as well. I've had solar on my house for uh, six years, and you know, on, after having, I think we've had seven electric vehicles now. Um, I can say that having solar was the smartest thing we could have done, especially pairing it with an EV and getting that across to the customers as well. Once they realize you can put the two together, it really is a nice synergy um, because I don't really pay for charging my car and I can run my AC and charge my car if I want to. So um, that makes it a really nice, nice combination to have. Um, on the next slide, we talk about uh, level one chargers and why not all charging charging stations are created equal. And I just made the first mistake. That's that's not a charger. That is a charging station or an electric vehicle supply equipment um, is what it's really called. The charger is on board the car. So a lot of times um, our customers don't really realize that the car really does a lot of the the controlling of the charging. It tells the station when it wants to be charged, how much it wants, and when it's done. So these these level one chargers that come with your car are level one because they only run on 120 volts AC and they're very slow and very slow. I mean, um, you're charging on a um, if you had a 20 amp circuit maximum output 16 amps. These cars are really only rated to take eight to 12 amps at that level. So you can imagine uh, at charging at a 1.4 kilowatt hour rate you're not getting a whole lot of charge into an 80 kilowatt hour battery very quickly. So these are great though, because the EV manufacturers have to have them, it's best to keep them with your car. That way if you're out somewhere and you end up next to a grocery store and you're out of charge for whatever reason, things happen, um, you can plug in to where they're, you know, if they'll let you to where their uh, vending machines are or whatever, at least to get enough charge to get home or to the next charging station. So really that's what they're good for and um, not much else, but they're, they're like I said, they when in an emergency and you have to have one, you want it on your car. Um, the next slide, we show our level two charger and the level two chargers are, are 240 volt AC and ours range from 32 amp output up to 80 amp output. Um, in most cases, and like Elise was saying earlier, uh, most people can use our juice box Pro 40 or our 40 with um, no issues getting a charge, a full charge overnight, no matter the size of their battery and how much they drive. Um, we find on average and um, through through um, beta tests that I was in, the average driver is only charging or only driving 40 to 60 miles a day on average. Um, yes, there are road warriors out there who work in their car and they drive much further and, and we understand that. But on average, when you're using a 40 amp charger, you can get a full charge in one to two hours, depending on your drive. Um, we also find um, that the cars that are charging um, longer, like the Bolt, the Tesla, um, yeah, they may wanna go to the 40 or the 48 if they're capable, um, even an 80 if they're really doing more than 250 miles a day. But in most cases, the 40 or the 32 is just fine for, for the average driver at home. Um, these stations are smart. They give you the information via our app and dashboard on how much they're charging, how much energy was used, how long it took to charge. And uh, most of all, you can put your price in there of what you're paying for your electricity um, so that you can, um, uh, sorry, my dog, <laughs> dogs just go. Sorry about that. Um, this is all, I guess, working at home. Sorry about that. Um, so the the uh, the charging at home does work better for that. Um, sorry. Next slide will be our DC fast charger. And while we do make it, um, it is smart, and we do sell it. It's not something you find as a common um, installation or need. It is becoming more common in what you would find maybe in a grocery store parking lot or a, um, uh, sorry, a shopping center, a retail center parking lot, something where people are, might be in and out in 30 minutes or less and they want to get a fast charge on their car. Um, you'll also see it for people who are charging um, on the road. Um, so they'll find a fast charger so they're only off the road, you know, 15 to 30 minutes to get enough to get to the next station. These are also smart. 
they're also fast and they're also a little bit more expensive to install. These require, um, and it's not really a level three, but the, the, the um, industry refers to it as a level three. It's really just DC fast charging. And this allows DC straight to the car's battery. It bypasses the car's onboard charger. Um, there's no need for the inverter, so it's very fast to the car. And again, it requires 480 volts, three phase to be installed. So something to consider if you have a customer looking for that. Um, not the cheapest installation, but if the customer's gonna charge for it, they need, just need to realize they're gonna be charging a lot for a long time before they recover um, a lot of those funds back for that installation. Um, so that leaves the other option for our commercial and um, retail customers, which, um, next slide please, is our juice stand and our juice pedestal. Um, this is the majority of what we sell to our residential, um, sorry, our commercial customers. Uh, the juice stand is a simple um, steel uh, square tube, basically, that you can attach to the ground, to the concrete. Um, you can mount one or two charging stations on it. Um, it's compatible with even residential. We do have some residential customers that want it just because they want it outside of their garage in their driveway. Maybe they don't park in their garage. Um, these have the avail availability for payment. So they have a QR code on the front. They can be set up to take a payment um, by anybody. However you have it set up, they load their credit card in and they, can, um, they will pay and the customer who owns the box would be getting the payments from that. And that's all set up in our dashboard. Um, with our help, of course, we help you get that set up. Um, and then we have our pedestal, which is a little bit more beefy, a little bit taller. I believe the size of the pedestal is right around eight inches square. Um, and then it can mount again to up to two stations. The biggest difference here is it has the retractable cable management so that the cable isn't necessarily laying on the ground every time someone charges and it will have the ability to have a UPT or universal payment terminal added so that if um, they wanna slide a credit card, they can do that. The QR code, they have to input everything via the app. With the UPT, they can slide a credit card or use their uh, mobile app to pay for a charge if they wanted to. Um, and again, you know, all of our products have a three-year warranty and we're UL and, and Canadian UL listed, so um, that's never been an issue. And um, we take great pride in that warranty because that's something my department works with and um, we, we, we try and do everything we can to help customers you know, answer questions or whatever may be going on with their setup. So um, I think the last thing I'll mention is um, these stations work with all EVs in North America um, that we make for North America. We do make products for Europe, but that's completely different. Um, but in North America, the J1772 standard, which is the handle that you see on EVs here for your level two or level one charging was adopted prior to, or I'm sorry, after Tesla put out their Roadster with their charging cable and had their standard. So in the North American market, yes, the Tesla plug is different, but all Teslas come with an adapter to mount to the J1772. So our station will work with a multi EV household that might have a Tesla and say a Bolt or an i3 or a Leaf, you can use the station with either um, of those cars and it will work just fine. The data is all the same and we give that um, option to you in our in our app to add those cars. So um, the, the next slide I think moves into our um, commercial, um, wait a minute. I'm sorry, I missed this one, uh, JuiceNet Enterprise Edition. Um, the Enterprise Edition is more for our commercial clients and fleets. So if uh, your customer has a building and they wanna put multiple stations in their parking garage or in their parking lot, um, then your customer can set up the accounts, set up the locations, set up the pricing, whether you're charging for ch um, the, uh, the cars to charge, whether it's free, uh, they control all of that. They can control the rate of charge they can charge, um, excuse me, they can control the time of use, meaning they can charge, you know, they can have cars not charging overnight if no one's at the building and only allow charging during the day. So it's all up to that station owner, how they wanna set it up. And again, enterprise um, drivers can also download the app so they don't have to be the owners of the station, but they can be given access by the station owners to um, charge. So we have condominium customers who use this 
where people are assigned parking spaces and that station is only assigned to maybe them and one other driver if it's between their spaces. So um, the enterprise gives us that added um, ability to control the stations for our commercial customers that our residential customers don't have as easy um, as easily to do or the need to do in a lot of cases. So on the next slide, you can see a couple of screenshots of our app. This is our um, driver user experience. And it's it's really is three, three slides are the most used on our app. Uh, that first slide that shows the status of the car. If it's not plugged in, it'll say standby. Obviously, if it's charging or if it's waiting for time of use. Maybe um, you're you're using your time of use and you're only charging your car during certain hours of the day, whether it be you know, nights or weekends with solar, I find I can charge during the day just fine. So maybe I only want to charge during the day so I'm not pulling if I don't have battery storage, if I'm not pulling off the grid at night. Um, I can do that. And it'll wait for that time of use. So when I plug in, my car will sit there and just not, it, my car will ask for a charge, but my juice box won't give it anything. And then when the time opens up, my juice box starts allowing uh, electricity to flow and the car will start taking it until it's done or until the time of use turns off. But in reality, it never gets past my time of use window, which I think I have five hours set. So you can control whether you see how many miles were added, how many kilowatts were added, or how long, uh, how much percentage of the battery. And that information is taken from the app when you input your car. So we have all the cars that we know of listed in there. If we don't, we will add it, but it goes by your battery size, your kilowatt charging rate, and the miles that you expect to get on a full charge. And it takes all of that into account so that when you plug in, if you have a 100 mile EV and you've charged 50%, it'll say it took 50% or it added 50 miles worth of charge to your car. Um, the other pages, the other app um, slides will show a live screen on the left there with shows the 11. That can be um, adjusted, that arrow can be adjusted to limit charging. Maybe you only want to charge five kilowatt hours during peak hours and turn it down um, and then go back to your time of use later. Maybe it'll charge that five kilowatt hours and stop. And then when your time of use comes on, you can reset the arrow to take a full charge and then it will take a full charge at that time. Um, you also have the history on the right. It'll tell you when the car, what time the car was plugged in, what time it was unplugged how long the charge took. So maybe you were plugged in for a day or two days in this time, but maybe the charge only took two hours. It'll tell you that. It'll tell you how many kilowatt hours and how long it took. Um, I found this great when I was out of town and my daughter was driving my car because I could see when she got home and when she unplugged the car to take off again. So a little parent tip there if your child is driving an EV. Um, it also allows, uh, we have a news feed link there and your juice points tracking, which some of our customers are eligible for and uh, juice points they get paid to charge and paid to be available to charge or be turned off for short periods of time okay and i think that's it for my section um i believe elise is going to continue with some of our commercial case studies yeah thanks kk and we can go to the next slide um, I'll just go over these fairly quickly because I think um, people may have questions that we want to answer. Um, these, um, this is um, the Gillette Stadium is uh, located in Boston and it's uh, the stadium where the um, Patriots are playing and also the soccer team, the Revolution soccer team. Uh, and um, they already had um, solar plus storage uh, powering their renewable energy uh, goals and um, they came to us and uh, we work with them to add EV charging stations to their um, public parking. So now anyone who attends a game uh, or also there is a, a um, shopping center close to uh, the stadium, anyone who goes there uh, can charge on our charging stations. We have 50 juice boxes uh, installed there. Um, and um, it just shows that, you know, how uh, concretely the synergy between um, solar plus uh, EV plus storage uh, all works together uh, on the commercial side. Um, let's go to the next use case, um, different type of um, customer. Uh, LFA Smart is a shopping center uh, in LA. Um, and then 
they had both um, they wanted to leverage uh, local incentives uh, that are offered by the um, the local utility LHWP. Um, and then also uh, one of the reasons they wanted to install uh, charging stations, they're actually not charging customers for charging on um, the, in their parking lot um, because, it, as I mentioned before, uh, they find that uh, offering free charging uh, increases uh, mall traffic. So it uh, increases the number of people who are interested in shopping in the shopping center and charging their EVs um, while they're shopping. And I, just like Chris, uh, I drive an EV too. I've been driving an EV for quite a while. And I have to say that um, when I make a decision of where to go shopping or eating, or even to choose, um, you know, like a local gym, I look to see if they have uh, charging stations available so that I can uh, charge. There is an um, uh, EV uh, driver, um, behavior that we call just like, you know, top off. So uh, EV drivers love to be uh, charging and topping up uh, their EV uh, batteries while um, they're running errands. So that's one of the reasons retail places are installing EV charging stations. Um, let's go to the next use case, case study. Uh, which I think it's um, about uh, yeah, Uncommon Developers as a commercial real estate developer uh, in California who needed to uh, comply with the uh, Cal Green regulations that I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, request a new uh, building to have a certain percentage of uh, parking spots reserved for EVs and EV charging. And um, they were able to leverage our chargers, our juice boxes, and install 116 juice boxes uh, to give access uh, to um, tenants to EV charging. Uh, and as um, Chris was mentioning, uh, with the software that comes with it, with uh, JuiceNet Enterprise, um, they have the ability to, um, tenants have the ability to see um, how much they're charging on these chargers. And then I think uh, we can go to the next session section where uh, Chris is going to be talking about um, some of the residential programs that we have uh, with uh, utilities in North America. Right. Thanks, Elise. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. We have we there's um we just pulled a couple of the the groups that we work with just as an example. But Puget Sound Energy is one of the groups we work with. Uh, they were one of our first that come on to do a pilot program with their customers. Um, and what they did was they offered the free juice box to their um, customer with installation. And then the utility paid for the, the station and the installer. Um, it gave them the ability to um, see the data that, that this test group could have, this pilot group could have. So they can plan for future grid events or grid demand. Um, getting a case with 500 juice box actually makes for a very nice um, control group, even for us because it kind of you know, brings everything into a smaller space that we can kind of see um, the, the pitfalls and what's going great and what's going good and what the customers like, what the utility likes and what the installers like. So um, it gave us a really good use case and we're still working with them. We have customers up there that are active. And um, again, we have 500 stations up there that the, the utility is actually owns and controls the data that they pull from and they pull the reports. Um, they don't control the um, charging for these customers, but they are getting the data. Um, the next slide, we have the Hawaiian Electric um, uh, program. Again, this one's a smaller group, 300 juice box smart chargers. But when you think about that, that's Hawaii. That's not a large population. It's not a large um, area, but 300 stations up there is quite, quite great because um, I know when I've been to Hawaii, there's EVs running around all over the place, and um, it makes a lot of sense. You have a smaller area to drive in. It's not like you're going to make, you know, major road trips um, like we can here, but um, it's a great place. They have great weather all the time, a lot of sunshine for solar. Um, and so we, with that program, we, we supplied, again, the juice box charging stations um, to the um, customers. The customers paid a shipping fee is all they paid. And um, I believe they paid for installation as well. And so in this case, um, Hawaii gave it through a residential rebate and the, um, the customers are still giving all the data 
and the utility is still seeing all of the data that they're charging with, again, so that they can um, charge during the day when solar production is highest. So that was the goal with Hawaii, was to have them charging at peak solar production times to see how much they were really pulling away from the grid and, and saving. Because when you think about some what the smart charging can do, we our smart chargers can actually provide electricity back to the grid in peak times because we're not pulling, you know, the cars are not pulling off of the grid as they would if they didn't have the solar. So that's a huge incentive for the, um, the utilities as well as the customer. Um, and then uh, the next slide, I believe, I'm going to talk a little bit about installation overview and getting started. Um, this can get a little bit wordy, so I just, without trying to read directly from the slides, I'm still going to, it does cover all the points I want, so I apologize for that, but I want to make sure we get the right information out to you. So um, next slide, please. With your site considerations, obviously you're going to look at the electrical requirements. Um, every level two charging station needs a dedicated circuit. What that means, a 240 volt, um, either 40, 50, 60, or 100 amp circuit. Um, and it needs to be rated 125% of the, the continuous load for that circuit. So our juice box 32 requires a 40 amp circuit. Continuous load is considered 100% of the time for all EVSEs. So you're gonna be running you know, eight gauge wire for that. Um, although the only stipulation to um, that is we do recommend a higher wire for the 50, but I'll get down to that in a minute. Um, we want You want to ensure that the electrical panel has the capacity and you're going to determine whether they want a hard wire or a plug-in. Um, that will determine part of what you're going to look at for the circuits and the breakers and everything, which will be on um, in just a minute. You're also going to look, do they have Wi-Fi connectivity? Um, Wi-Fi is the main way to get the information to and from the juice box. So if they don't have Wi-Fi, we do have a juice router that's available that generates um, a Wi-Fi signal from cellular. It can be mounted anywhere near the boxes as long as they um, it's close to the boxes and you're getting a good Wi-Fi or a good cellular signal. And it will do up to 16 charging stations per router. Uh, this, there's a small data plan on there, um, which you would be paying for. Um, I, mean, I don't remember the exact amount, but it's not a lot. I believe it's 150 gigabytes of RAM um, or 300, depending on if you do the larger one um, that you're allowed. Um, when you're considering the layouts, this is a funny one to me only because it has rec we recommend all charging stations be near the existing electrical. It's obviously cheaper that way if you're gonna be near the, you know, the electric room or the switch gear, um, if you can. Uh, but as a driver, I don't like, you know, it's it's hard to have a uh, parking spot really close to that because the other people who don't drive EVs like that spot because it's close. So a lot of times you find you can't park there to charge your car. So that's one thing you might want to consider is where can it be close to the electrical but not a prime spot for parking um, for other drivers that might ice you out of your parking space so you can charge your car. Um, most important in California during Christmas because they put a lot of these in malls. And so one, it's hard to get into the mall in December normally, and then you can't get the charging that you need. So just something to consider. And then layout considerations. Um, of course, like I said, we recommend they're all, all by the electrical, but um, high visibility so drivers know where to charge. Obviously, if it's in the dark corner of a parking lot and all you see is a blue light flashing in the distance that there's a station there, um, me, by myself, um, I'm not going to go into that corner to park my car and charge necessarily um, unless I have someone with me or, you know, I don't want to have to go get mall security to go. I want it to be in a nice, well-lit area um, so I can charge safely and feel safe charging. And then also, you need to consider um, the ADA Act because they uh, will require some charging, uh, some localities will require a charging station when you install a group of chargers in a handicapped spot. And there are certain regulations that go with that. Depends on what side of the, the parking stall they want it on, where it can be mounted, and who has access to it. So some things to consider there. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, which is the installation overview. Um, again, this is where I'll go a little bit deeper, but according to the National Electrical Code, um, again, all, all EVSE circuits are continuous and the circuit needs to be 125%. The standard table that most of us use is 31015B16. Um, on there, 
Um, it does say you can get 55 amps out of eight gauge wire THHN, but we always require six gauge wire, um, mostly because like I said, when you're charging cars for a longer period of time, there is some heat involved. Um, not a lot, but just your normal heat from having a circuit go for, could be multiple hours. So the six gauge wire seems to be much less problematic and um, not a whole lot more expensive to install. Um, if you're going over, you know, 100 feet out to a parking lot, you definitely want to size that up for the voltage drop. Um, also, a GFCI breaker is recommend is as actually in the code now for any circuits over 150 volts to ground, or I think and 50 amps. I can't remember the exact wording, but what that means is if you're installing a station outdoors, they they may or may not require you to install a GFI circuit breaker for that. Um, 14 NEMA 1450 or NEMA 650. So in that case, we recommend a hardwired installation. Um, reason being is we send leakage current back on the ground because there's no neutral involved. So because of that, you can get nuisance tripping on a GFCI breaker. So we just, like I said, we recommend no, if they need a GFCI and it's required by the AHJ, then go to a hardwired installation and that'll solve that problem. Um, the mounting is pretty simple. It's the, uh, there's one bar on the back that mounts to the wall. It's in line so it can catch one stud. And then you slide the box into that and it locks into place. Um, the mounting on the pedestal or the stand, uh, those need to be installed on a concrete pad. And we have all of our information, installation requirements, anything you'd ever want to know about these um, stations in our um, partner portal that we use with our customers are commercial installers, solar installers, to where you can get all of that information. Um, there's even uh, a certification you can go through if you would like to. So um, I believe we can send the link. Um, well, we don't send the link to that to non-customers, but we do have that information available if you're going to become a customer. Um, and then wiring is routed through the center of both the stand and the pedestal. So again, you're stubbing up to the bottom of the pedestal and then your wires are um, coming up through there and you can, there's no need for a juice box inside. They're both rated as raceways, but the, um, the wiring will all take place in the pedestals or in the stand itself. So no need to have anything outside. You can have it outside and you can have a junction box mounted to the, um, the steel um, stand, but it's, you know, obviously it's a personal choice, whatever the customer would like. Um, so that was all I had, I believe. Um, and I'll pass back for the next steps. Thank you very much, Chris and Elise for a fantastic presentation. Um, I personally have uh, EV um, and I have a, actually have a, a juice box and I, it's just, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I think one thing that was pointed out earlier that is driving an EV, it changes your perception on having a car. Like I will, will never drive a combustion engine car again. It's so much better experience. So I think that is, once people try an EV, they're gonna stick with an EV. Um, yeah. So that's just a personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanna to get to some questions that we have. Um, we've got a lot of questions. So why don't we start with, uh, are there chargers for, uh, for consumer usage and public battery chargers? If so, how does that compare to gas prices? Um. I, I can take that one to start with, and then uh, Chris can add. Um, it, it just depends. Some some public charging stations are set uh, for free charging, and others um, charge a fee. Uh, it's pretty much dependent on um, the um, facility owner, on the building owner, to decide uh, how much they want to charge. Um, and there are also some, you know, uh, fast charging networks uh, where people can have. Um, uh, subscriptions, monthly subscriptions. So it's it really depends on uh, the location of the of the uh, charging stations. But in terms of uh, the cost of fueling an EV versus um, gas car, uh, all the data and it also, it also depends on where you live uh, in the U.S. There are some areas where electricity is cheaper, so it's going to be cheaper to drive uh, your EV in these areas. Uh, but on average, uh, national averages, you can save. 40 to 70 percent um, driving an EV uh, rather than um, fueling a, a gas car. 
and that's just uh, for the the cost of um, charging your EV versus putting gas in your car and then you have uh, additional uh, savings on uh, maintenance because um, there are very few parts in an EV so they just don't break uh, for example um, Tesla doesn't even require an annual uh, maintenance um, because they, they their cars you know there's less parts to to break so it's much cheaper to drive an EV in general. Excellent. Thank you very much. Another question that just came in says, <clears throat> are your stations universal? How do you pl uh, plug in different manufacturers? How, do, how does the, um, the nozzle adapt to different manufacturers? And should you have multiple chargers at your house if you have different cars? Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. Chris, I, Chris yeah, can I can, yeah, I'll speak to that one. So um, that's a question we actually get quite frequently because of the Tesla. Um, in North America, the standard is the J1772, and Tesla had their standard before the 1772 was adopted as the North American standard. So that is why their nozzle is different. But the um, every Tesla sold in the North American market comes with an adapter. Um, if someone didn't get one or lost it, they can purchase it from Tesla. I think it's $100, but it does come with the car. And so that has a J1772 um, receptacle on one side, and then it goes into their car on the other. And so you can use, um, for example, your house has a Tesla and a Bolt. Um, they can both use the juice box just fine. It's just the adapter would be used with the Tesla all of the data, all of the controls, everything would be the same as you'd have for the bolt that you set up on the juice box. So yeah, the only the only thing people think, I, I think they see sometimes is the DC fast charging, um, and that's where the Chatamo and the SAE combo come in. Those are different. The Asian market has the Chatamo. Uh, North America, Europe mostly use the SAE combo. Um, the Chatamo is being phased out, so it will all go to SAE combo in the future. But that's really the only difference on those is fast charging. And again, a Tesla can use a Chatamo station with one of their adapters. Um, but the um, the most of the RGC fast charger does have both handles, both nozzles on there for Chatamo and um, SAE combo. Thank yeah. you, Chris. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add one quick thing because it's important for this crowd is essentially when you uh, in chart when you install an NLX charging stations, everybody can um, charge. So it's important for, you know, destination charging like hotels or everything. If they install a Tesla charger, only Tesla cars can charge on a Tesla charger. But if you install an NLX smart charger, whether it's a level two or level three charging station, everybody can charge on that charger. And that's also why uh, utilities provide uh, incentives for our stations, but not for Tesla stations, because they want to make sure it's a universal charging access so that's an important question mm -hmm. excellent thank you very much we've got a lot of really good questions um and any question that we don't get to in this q a session we will respond directly to the person that asked it um afterwards so just as a, as a heads up next question that came in is can you use a high uh, high frequency off-grid inverter or do you need to upgrade to a low frequency inverter when you set up your EV charging station. I have a feeling I should probably take that. Yeah, <laughs> um, but well, I'm not. I'm not really sure how to answer. Only because, um, we, well, we have found with our juice boxes previously that we did have to um, go back and retrofit a filter into some of them for solar customers because there was some interference coming up with the juice box. So um, part of that was it's actually not a bad thing it's my team figured out what the problem was we went to engineering engineering said we can install this filter and see if it helps to filter out this noise and we did and it solved 99 percent of the problems with our solar customers so i would say right now we have the filter on there on our our current juice box station so that probably isn't an issue um so i'm not sure if you would need to change whether it's a um high frequency or low frequency inverter, if that makes sense. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Here's another question that came in. Um, does the smart charger allow tracking a vehicle specific electrical consumption 
and miles driven between charges for fleet management? That's probably another question for you, Chris. Yeah, actually it does. So that's the one great thing about our um, software with our, our dashboard and our app. Every charging station shows up there. So even for fleet management, when you assign uh, someone an account, you'll see when they're charging and you'll see how long they charged, how many kilowatt hours they used, um, if they and they and if their car is listed in their account, you can see their car. But um, yes, every every charging session is its own session and they're ID'd by those users in the commercial accounts. Um, on a residential system, if they don't use that, then uh, the only time you know who is using the station is if they override something. So for example, if time of use is set at my house and I come home um, early, if I override to charge, then you'll see my name show up in my reports that I charged at that time. But for the fleet management, yes, it does show and that's how the condominium and apartment um, owners can manage who's being charged for what or who's using what. Yeah, Excellent. and Thank I'll you. just add one thing. There's different ways to give to authorize access for people. So you can do it via the app or you can also use RFID cards for some of your commercial customers that prefer RFID cards. Mm -hmm. Our stations also work with RFID cards and then you can just provide different RFIDs to different um, users of the charging stations. And or you can do it via the app, whatever is easier for your customers. Yeah, and one more thing I wanna add, just to be clear about the miles. Uh, miles is a very um, loosely used term with EVs as far as measurement. Uh, miles are really based on the driver and how they drive the car and no two really drive the same. So you wanna look at the kilowatt hours and if you if the driver knows how many miles they're getting per kilowatt hour, it gives you a little bit better idea on miles. But um, miles is not your best measurement. Kilowatt hours is your, always your best measurement because it's always most accurate. Excellent. Thank you very much. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. I know we're running over a little bit. One thing I want to be very clear is if you do want to get continuing education NAPSEC credits, please. Um, email us at hello at cedgreentech.com with the subject line NABZEP, and they will be sure to issue your continuing education credits. That's, it's on the screen right there, hello at cedgreentech.com, and with, with subject line NABZEP, and we'll process those credits correctly for those that attended and, and stayed for the, for, the, uh, for the presentation. So thank you very much for, uh, for this presentation. And thank you for attending today. I know everyone's got a tight schedule, so we really are very appreciative that you're here with us.